I'm going to talk about today is signs and symptoms of, of neuromuscular disorders, kind of just to help you <clears throat> talk about and, and examine your patients and figure out, do they have a real neuromuscular problem? Um, this morning, we concentrated on normal, what is normal, you know, normal um, uh, development and gait and whatnot. So one of the things that I think is the most important is actually being able to see the exam and see the findings that we're talking about and how to do these exam things. And so Hank Chambers is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon in California. And I was, I was at a series of lectures he gave, I think it's probably been 10 years ago. And he had these awesome videos in there. And I asked him and he graciously just handed me a CD of all these videos that he had. And then I saw him a couple of years later and he said, you know, I was at another talk and somebody was showing all my videos and there I am in the videos and they didn't even say anything. They didn't say thanks to me or give me credit. So he's got credit. So if you ever meet Hank Chambers, say, oh, Dr. Jax told me about you. So, um, so anyway, uh, <clears throat> on your physical exam, the most important part of the physical exam isn't the exam. The most important part of the physical exam is the history. Everybody already said that. Um, for neuromuscular problems, the most important piece of the exam, I think, is the the um, family and social history. You want to know, <clears throat> were they developing normally and then they had meningitis? <laughs> well, that's pretty obvious, right? There, there's, a, there's a stumbling block. But crazy how hard it is to get that information out of parents sometimes, you know? Oh, yeah. Is that important? Yes. In fact, it is. Um, uh, family history. The fact that, you know, you see them. You, you, we walk into the room, the parents are sitting down. The mom is sitting down and the kid is walking, you know, up on their toes through the exam room, kind of doing this thing. And, and the mom's like, gee, I don't know what's wrong. I guess they probably have CP, you know. And then the mom gets up and walks across the room like this. Oh, well, or maybe it's hereditary spastic paraparesis. Could be. I don't know. Just a bone doctor. Um, so that's kind of where that comes from. So I think, you know, you have to know the history, and it really helps a lot to have that kind of history. So once you get down to the physical exam, you want to go through the parts that everybody has already talked about. We've already stressed a lot of this stuff. You go through step by step, and once we get going here, we're going to get down to that bottom, which is, which is the physical neurologic tests and special tests. I think it was Dr. Moyer that already talked a little bit about Gower's sign. But he didn't have a fancy video. So actually, this is from back when I was at Wake Forest. My first job out was at Wake Forest. So they had ugly, grungy carpet. Our office it was much cuter than that. Um, that's the, the important thing here isn't that, that she doesn't do the classic walking up the legs. You don't have to have every bit of that. But she could. there's no way she would have been able to get up off the floor if she couldn't like stabilize in that four point stance and then slowly pull herself up off the floor like that. That's a, that's a positive Gower sign. And when um, you looked at her from the side, she had uh, big hypertrophy or calves and stuff. So we're gonna watch <clears throat> uh, people walk. Once you, when I walk into the room, I put this lecture together kind of in the order that I have them do things. So I, I walk in the room, I always have them get off the table and sit on the floor. <coughs> Sorry, in the way. <coughs> Sorry, so the way I do a Gower sign is I tell the kids to sit on the floor, hold on to their ears, and then stand up without letting go of their ears. And if you can do that, then you don't have muscular dystrophy, most likely, or really early, I suppose. Um, <coughs> and then that kind of breaks the ice a little bit because it's a little bit of a challenge for the kid and then they're, they never know what you're gonna ask them to do next. So then I have them go out in the hall and walk up and down the hall for me. And I try to watch them walk from two angles. So I will try to watch them walk <coughs> away, uh, toward me and away from me and then from the sides. So this girl you can see, if you watch her walking away from you and toward you, she I think looks pretty normal, you know, it's not bad. You can see when she's close to you that her heels aren't hitting the ground, but it's that side view that really makes it clear that she's up on her toes, I think. And she's, this is, she's an idiopathic toe walker. <clears throat> and then you have somebody like this. This is Hank's video. And this is a, a clearly, thank you, an asymmetric kid. And he's got hemiplegia. And you can see he's dragging his toes on his left side. 
He postures a little bit with his left arm and he keeps his left arm in pronation. He's holding the reflex hammer, so he's keeping his left arm a little bit turned over like that. It's a little subtle, he hides it by holding onto the reflex hammer. But that's pretty clear that that is an abnormal gait. To me, it takes me two seconds. I could watch that kid walk from the examining table to his mother's lap and tell you that kid has hemiplegia. But if you're not used to looking at that, that takes a little bit more to be able to see that. <clears throat> so that's just your overall quick inspection. Um, when they're sitting on the table, just sitting there before they get up or after they come back in the room and they're sitting there, you also can find a lot of things just by how they sit on the table. Thanks, Marcelo. Um, so do they have good head, head control? Can they uh, maintain their head? Um, they're sitting on their parent's lap. Can, it, you know, a lot of times they're leaning back against the parent or the parent's holding the head like this. If they let go, is the head just gonna go over? That's the first thing. So do they have head control? If they can sit independently, are their shoulders even? Or when they sit down, are they sitting over like this? Or literally, sometimes they sit like this, leaning over to one side. Um, not, not tilting, but leaning, OK? Um, the sp spine attitude, by that I don't mean like attitude. I mean, is their spine, when they're sitting, are they sitting up straight with their back straight? Or are they sitting all slumpy like this with their spine like that, you know? Um, and do they, are they stable when they sit? Can they sit on the side of the exam room table and put their hands up or do they have to lean on one hand or do they have to like, I call it taco sitting when they sit uh, crisscross applesauce on the exam room table and kind of fold themselves over so their abdomen is taking some of their weight. Um, this is, if you're from there uh, sitting on the side of the examining room table, I go on to laying them supine and do a hip exam. Again, this is Hank doing his exam. So you lay them back on the back of the table. And the idea of flexing the one hip up like that to, uh, stabilize, is to stabilize the pelvis so that you can see um, how much the hip is really extending relative to the, the pelvis. It doesn't really matter where it is relative to the other leg. We want to know where it is relative to the spine. <clears throat> so that line is, is uh, along the track of his spine. If you pull that other leg, the leg that you're not testing, if you pull it all the way up until it's up against his chest, you're actually rolling the pelvis forward. Do you see what I mean? You, so the idea is hold the other leg up enough that it stabilizes the pelvis, but not so much that you roll it forward. And there's no way to know. I mean, these kids are so flexible, and they're, they're just trying to help you out. They're going to hold their leg like that and do anything to help you out so that they can get out of there and get their candy for being good. Um, so another way to do it is this prone hip flexion test. So you hang them off the side of the table and you pull the leg up. And you can imagine in a kid who has CP that doesn't have good balance and they usually are afraid of heights anyway, this is kind of risky. Um, so, but it's, it's a really good test. I think it helps to stabilize that other hip a little better. And you can actually visibly see the pelvis a little better. And if they're pooching it up, you know, they're, they're, uh, you're not getting a good measurement. For hip abduction, um, I entirely disagree with um, that line that was, is drawn on there. What's that, that up, up and down line pointing at anyway? Because his spine is in, in alignment with that. So really, instead of that line being up and down, there really should be a line that's going sideways connecting his uh, iliac crest. So across here like this, there should be a transverse line across there. And this line is actually perpendicular to that transverse line. Um, it's hard to do that, though, because you have to have one leg on each, or one hand on each leg, and one hand on each of his iliac crests to see where they are. And I ran out of, ran out of hands two hands ago. So it's easier to do that if you have two examiners in the room. Somebody keeps their fingers on the iliac crest so you can see it, because the kid is literally trying to help you. And you spread his legs out, and they'll, they'll like cock their whole body over to keep it even and so that you can see what you want to see. Um, the internal external rotation. What we're looking for on this in the neuromuscular kid is often asymmetry. So this kid has mild asymmetry, one's 80, one's 70. So the 80 one is bad, right? That's too high. Amanda said that uh, greater than 70 degrees is abnormal. The irony there is that this is a kid with left hemiplegia and his left side was the normal one. Ha, huh. crazy. So um, 
it is what it is. Some kids don't read the book. So in CP, we see excessive internal rotation. So a lot of times in kids with CP, I can take them in that position and put their legs out and their feet sit right down on the examining room table. It's, it's disconcerting at first until you get used to it. Um, the popliteal angle is a uh, controversial angle in uh, pediatric orthopedics only because we can't decide which one to say, that 30 degrees or 150 degrees. You guys know that pop that a, uh, an angle, you can have the angle or the inverse, you know, so you have your obtuse and your acute angle. This space is the popliteal space. In my opinion, the angle is named the popliteal angle. We ought to call it, we ought to name it for what it is, and that's the popliteal space. So the uh, Shriners Hospital started a, they, want, they, they actually published that they wanted everybody to call it this angle because this is the popliteal space. They wanted everybody to use 150 degrees. And like so many things, as soon as they came out with that, all the literature immediately went to using this number. So really, more and more of the literature, I think, is using the, the smaller angle. But I was trained at a Shriners Hospital, so I use the big angle, so it is what it is. I don't know. It's, it's dealer's choice. Most important thing is to be consistent and to know what you're talking about. If you guys were to call me, you can say, you know what? His hamstrings are tight. I got that. That's fine. OK? You don't have to tell me a number. I, I'm not going to you know, hold you down and measure it. The important thing on the next bit of this is that when you do the popliteal angle test, when you're checking for hamstring tightness, the hamstrings start at the, they insert at the, at the uh, tibia. They actually originate at the, at the uh, ischial tuberosity. So they, it, they f extend the hip and flex the knee, okay? So in order to check and see if they're tight, you have to do the opposite. You flex the hip passively and extend the knee passively, okay? But in order to flex the hip and to know that you're flexing the hip, we already said you have to stabilize the pelvis so you know where it is. So we're doing the opposite. When we did the hip flexion test, we flexed the contralateral hip. So when we want to flex the hip and we want to know how much we're flexing it, we have to extend the contralateral hip. So we leave the contralateral hip in extension. We flex that to 90 degrees from the, from, from the spine and thigh line. We flex that to 90 degrees and then we gently extend the knee and that angle is what we get for the popliteal angle. Again, I don't, you don't have to say the popliteal angle is this or that, but to appreciate that it's hamstring tightness that's causing the problem I think is the critical thing here. Um, then uh, Dr. Chamber, Chambers goes on to show that if you don't stabilize the pelvis and instead you lift up both legs and you don't c control for that, look, all of a sudden he can get his knees perfectly straight. So he doesn't actually have a knee joint contracture. He doesn't have knee contractures. He has hamstring contractures, and there's a difference, okay? So if you are standing up and you're walking, when you take a step forward, as you reach forward with your leg, you're, you are flexing your hip and extending your knee. If you have tight hamstrings, when you get to terminal swing and are ready to put that foot down for the next one, that hamstring is relatively tight. So at that point, when you are about to put your foot down, your hamstring is triggered. And so in kids with CP, especially if they're asymmetrical, like that kid has one side affected, he'll have a shorter step length on that side. And they come, they're more likely to come down on their toe because they can't get their heel down because they can't get that knee out into extension, okay? Long explanation, but I think it's worth it. So this is um, to test how tight the quadriceps are. So see this kid, he's all playing around and goofing around up there, but um, he can, uh, Dr. Chambers can flex his knee, no problem. Then all of a sudden, when he tries to speed it up, that quadriceps gets tight. When he does it slowly, no problem. If you do it fast, big problem, okay? So that's the Duncan Ely test. And again, I don't care if you know the name of it. Some guys got their name associated with it. So spasticity is velocity dependent. This joint doesn't have a contracture. The joint moves fine. But the faster you passively try to move it, the more the joint resists you. This is classic in CP. CP has spasticity. This is a corticospinal tract problem or the cortex of the brain is affected and it's causing this problem. I don't care if you can tell me the number. I don't need to know the number. None of that matters. 
Um, we look for the total angle, but also what's important is see how his butt is picking up off the table when, you know, when he gets maximally flexed. That's because the, the quadriceps, the rectus femoris, flexes the hip and extends the knee. I know, I know, all this anatomy, it's too much. Um, but it, so he has actually a little bit of a quadriceps contracture. Um, but what's important is that it got really tight when he tried to use it fast. So what does that do in gait? Okay, we already know that his hamstrings are a little tight, so he can't reach out to take the big step because his hamstrings are tight. That's kind of like every, anybody go gardening sometimes on the weekend and you spend your time pulling your weeds and you spend the whole day over like this, and then the next day you're like, oh my God, I can't walk, I can't take a step because your hamstrings hurt, right? You can't reach forward with your legs. It hurts when you extend to put the heel down. That's the same thing. He also has a quadriceps contracture, quadriceps spasticity. What happens with that is when he's walking and right before he picks his um, foot up off the ground, his hip is in extension and his knee has to flex a little to help him get his he get clear his toes to get his foot through, right? So he's at, he's stretching that quadriceps. He's stretching it where it flexes the hip and he's stretching it where it extends the knee and that all of a sudden puts a little pressure on that and activates a little spasticity in the knee and causes the knee to straighten out just like it does when Dr. Chambers rapidly flexes it there. So he's trying to swing through and his knee wants to be straight. What? How can you swing through if your knee is straight? Did you notice what happens? He drags his toe because his knee is, and also what he does to, to compensate is goes up on his toes on his other side a little bit to help him bring his foot through, okay? If I fall off the stage, please don't laugh at me. So let's watch that again. So he gets that up slowly, no problem. A little faster, butt pooching up, and oh my gosh, look at that spasticity. So when he runs, you know that is very tight back there. Um, so this is uh, uh, Dr. Moyer, Dr. Y. Everybody talked about how you have to invert the heel to check range of motion of the ankle. It kind of looks funny, right? He's got that foot so twisted up that you can see all of his toes pointing at us, but that's the way we in orthopedics, that's the way we check range of motion. You guys all sitting there, try to dorsiflex your ankle and keep your foot inverted. Keep it inverted. It's harder to do. You feel it pulling your perineals a little bit and you can't go as far. And then if you evert it and you try to dorsiflex, you're gonna get an extra five degrees or so, okay? But to be consistent, we want it inverted. We wanna lock that, that hind foot, and I don't wanna measure your subtalar motion, I wanna measure your ankle motion. I wanna measure exactly what you have at the actual ankle. And so this is the best way to test it. You also notice that um, you get better range of motion if you test dorsiflexion with the knee flexed as opposed to extended. We can all do that too. You're all sitting down. You have your knees flexed because you're sitting. While you're sitting there, go ahead and dorsiflex your ankle. I love just being able to say that. When I talk to parents, I have to say, lift up your toes. So dorsiflex your ankle. Now, keeping your ankle dorsiflexed, straighten out your knee. What do you feel? You feel tightness in the proximal gastroc. You feel it stretching across the back of your knee. Moderately unpleasant for us. Really ridiculously unpleasant for a kid who has an ankle plantar flexion contracture that we put in a cast after Botox or just for idiopathic toe walking. That's why some of them don't tolerate the casting very well is because they're really tight. And then we put them in cast and we say, okay, get up and walk away. And when they get up and they try to straighten out their knees to walk away, it's very difficult. Um, so on to other neurologic tests. So, uh, you know, you're not neurologists. I'm not a neurologist. Our job is not to diagnose the problem really, to, I'm not gonna, I, I, it's not true. I'm gonna try not to be the one that give the diagnosis. I try to get the neurologist to do that. Um, but to, act, to at least have an idea what tests to do to tell you there's a problem, I think is good. You guys all know how to do reflexes. Um, but sometimes I think we do, we know how to do the reflex. It's a different matter of knowing what to do with it when you find the abnormal uh, result, okay? So we'll talk about these different things. So just to test a reflex, this is um, the normal side there compared to the abnormal side here. There's a big response difference there, right? So kids can have a brisk reflex. As long as it's a little brisk on both sides, symmetric, that's okay. But this asymmetry is very bad. And if you have clonus on both sides, that's really not a good thing. 
Um, this next one is to show Clonus, and I personally don't think it shows great on here. Um, he does have Clonus. You can see it if you watch the video a little bit. You can see that Clonus, and I don't know if all of you even really know what Clonus is. So in order to give you a better idea what Clonus is, I got a really awesome video of it. So this is really severe. Your kids will not have Clonus this bad if they're mild like that kid, okay? But this is kind of fun to play with sometimes. So slowly, no problem. Fast, and I could hold that all day. As long as I kept constant tension on that, he would keep tapping that foot. You notice I'm not yanking it up. I'm not pulling it really hard. You just want to go fast enough to initiate that response, and it just starts going. So what about clonus elsewhere? Can you get clonus in the hand? Well, you know you can, or I wouldn't have taken the video, right? So slowly, not too bad, fast. Can you see his finger wiggling? Hold on, here we go again. I can open up his hand, that's not a problem. There we go. Pretty impressive, huh? How about the other one? This is his good hand. This is where he drives his motorized wheelchair. Thank goodness he's not on the streets, right? Can't trust that. Um, what about clonus? So does clonus always require that we actually touch the patient? Well, sadly, no. Um, sometimes all you have to do, oh, go, come on. Sometimes all you have to do is tell a joke. He goes through wheelchairs really fast. He literally vibrates the screws out of his wheelchair. And that, and because he's cognitively normal, and when things are funny, he laughs, and <laughs> his whole body goes, does like that. And he has a backlift and pump. Um, that's as good as it gets. Uh, so, um, you know, I don't care, again, I don't care if you tell me it's a Tardo, Tardo 1, Tardo 5, you know, Ashworth 4. You don't have to know the number. To me, what's important is this scale gives you an idea. If it's normal, you can tell me it's normal. It, if it has, you know, uh, the exam, like on that little boy that Dr. Chambers was doing, if you take your time and you push hard on that popliteal angle, I bet you could get him all the way up to 90 degrees, and he'd be squirming a little, but you could do it. And you could say, oh, he's got full range of motion. It's all good. But the important thing is there, there is the difference between that side and the other side. The, the side that's tighter, um, his, his involved side has that resistance prior to end range, as opposed to his normal side that you can just crank right up there. So it's important that you get a sense of that, um, that slow resistance, okay? And that the difference between the two sides. Um, this is the last one. This is the Babinski test. You guys know that. It is a sign of an upper motor neuron lesion and the toes spread out. He didn't do the Babinski. I don't think he did. Did he do it on the other side? I think it's only on the one. So you guys know that, so the Babinski test is extensor um, in, uh, in an ab, in, in a upper motor neuron lesion and is flexor in normal kids. And of course, in all kids who are ticklish, it's extensor or flexor, it's all over the place. So you have to have a pretty cooperative kid. Um, he uses the blunt end of the reflex hammer there. I'll, sometimes you can start with your thumbnail, but I wouldn't start with thumbnail because then you'll never get to do it twice. Um, so you want to start, I usually buckle my finger over and use the top of my knuckle to do it. And in the really ticklish kids, you might not even just use the flat of your hand and just gently do it because if they're really ticklish, they're not going to let you really get a good exam. They're going to just clench and pull away. Um, but that one, I love that, that video. That's a great video of the Babinski test. And so. Um, here I had a, a video of the, uh, the Ministry of the Silly Walk from uh, uh, Monty Python, which is really funny, but uh, the YouTube, YouTube won't let you link directly to YouTube videos anymore, so it's not on there, but it's worth it. So I found this little uh, sketch of the individual pictures. of. If you guys haven't seen it, it's worth it. You can go to YouTube and put in Ministry of Silly Walk and watch the videos. They're very, very funny for people who look at gate all the time. Um, anyway, so uh, that's that on the uh, signs and symptoms. Whoever's next, I believe that's you, Dr. Nemeth. Are you going to introduce him again?